who lawyers in New York may have just ruined their legal careers by trying to use ChatGPT, which is the AI uh, software that can write out a bunch of text for you to write legal motions that they then submitted to a court uh, in a federal court in New York. And it turns out that the uh, ChatGPT software was making up legal opinions that did not exist and citing them to the court and then literally wrote out fake legal opinions that the lawyers then submitted to the court saying that they were real uh, and apparently did not realize this. Uh, and the reason that they thought that everything was okay is because they went to ChatGPT and asked it, hey, are these opinions fake? And it said, no, 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 they're real. And those lawyers are in a lot of trouble. I'm Kevin Newper. I'm an attorney at Newper and & Covey. And I wanted to explain to you today uh, all the drama around this. It is one of the craziest legal cases I've ever seen. Uh, it really may ruin these guys' careers because they just sort of doubled down and tripled down on this thing. Uh, and why uh, a artificial intelligence will not be replacing lawyers anytime soon. Definitely not for legal briefs. Uh, you, it, it is actually good. You can see this image behind me was generated with uh, Midjourney, which is an AI program. I use it to do uh, uh, the images in, in most of my thumbnails, uh, really kind of all of them now. They're fun. You can make all this cool art. Uh, but you do kind of need a human to like vet things. And especially in a legal case, when you go submit a legal brief, it is not that there are people saying, oh, lawyers will go away. Uh, we can just have the AI do it. Um, this case really shows you why I don't think that's true. I think that AI will probably not replace lawyers until it is basically what's called general AI, um, uh, which is, is kind of AI that is effectively the same as a human. It is actually conscious, that can think, uh, because you can't just submit documents in a lawsuit. Uh, uh, briefs are, are rely on a lot of strategy. They rely on a lot of thought. And what these lawyers did was just not even check and just kind of keep submitting stuff. And then instead of actually looking for the opinions, whenever everyone started saying, where are they, including the judge, they just went in and said, um, here's, these, here's, here's, here's some from, they didn't even tell them it was from chat GPT. So I'm going to show you all the court documents, how this all came about. We don't know what the judge is going to do, but I can tell you um, the level of incompetence here um, is kind of staggering and off the charts that any lawyer would do this. So here's the document that caused everything to start going horribly, horribly wrong in this case. This document, uh, the, the legal arguments here were written by ChatGPT. It's not disclosed. You can't tell that. Um, but at least looking at it, um, it doesn't look that unusual. It's sort of like um, kind of a motion. It's like they call it. An, so basically one, what this case is, is it's a guy who is a lawyer who um, was injured on an airplane. Uh, he was like a passenger. Uh, I think one of the employees like bumped a metal box into him or something. So it's a personal injury case. Those generally aren't that complex. Uh, he's, they're suing this airline called Avianca. Uh, and uh, this this law firm's representing him, this uh, Levado, Levado, and Oberman, uh, and has a couple attorneys work on the case. And then he's also kind of like working on his own case. And so the guys, uh, or, or this is uh, Roberta Mata. Um, and uh, it may not be a guy. Uh, so that, but, but the, the two guys who are involved in this, who actually submitted this are, are different people and they are, um, actual lawyers. So, so this is Peter Loduca is the one who's sort of submitting this motion. Um, and there's another guy that we'll see who's sort of, uh, also on this. And I was actually surprised that these are kind of senior lawyers, um, older than me, actually, like in their, look like in their fifties for both these guys or, or, or later. Um, and you can kind of see some factual background here. They're just talking about the case. None of this is too, like unusual. It's not like a great brief, but it's not, I wouldn't look at this and be like, oh, you know, what's wrong here, right? Like this first case is a real case. Um, everybody, every lawyer will probably know Iqbal. Um, then they start uh, talking about these other cases. I'm not sure if the whole brief was written by an AI, but uh, there's parts of it about this kind of more complex areas of law. And now you start seeing this stuff where it doesn't Im immediately like, I don't just read this and go, oh, wow, we have a problem. It just sort of looks like a brief um, that's kind of what the chat GPT thing does is it makes documents that it will go look at legal briefs and then it may make stuff that's coherent and kind of makes sense when you read it. And it's, and it's citing what all appear to be a bunch of legal cases. The, all these numbers are telling you where to go find them. Uh, you can see the underlying part is like the name of what's supposed to be the case. And, and then they'll have, um, when you see these numbers here, it's kind of important to this later on, like 360 NJ Super 360 is supposed to be telling you um, like where to go find this opinion because they're published in, in, you ever see those lawyer commercials and you see a bunch of books behind the lawyer and it makes them look like, oh, I'm super smart. I got a million books behind me. Um, that's where they used to put these. They're not all, all electronic now, but you would go to like book number 360, page number 360 in that, uh, uh, in the books that have the New Jersey opinions for the superior court or whatever. Um, this one is from what, when it says WL, it means that you pulled it off Westlaw, which is a research, um, uh, uh, like database thing. It has all legal opinions. It has its own coding system. So it has the year of the opinion. And then uh, this number is like, which takes you to the, the page of the opinion. Just type this in. And then it tells you what's court. Like this is supposed to be from a Texas appellate court. 
So they're, they're saying, uh, you know, the, what the brief seems to be saying is, look, here's all these legal cases. They say this. Here's what happened in the case. You know, there's this, this case about a uh, airline flight from Amsterdam to Atlanta and wrongful death and stuff. There's stuff, all these things, this Farkey's case, which is supposed to be from the 11th Circuit. That's a case or, or a, a appellate court down in Georgia. Um, and so you see all these in here. Nothing unusual off the top of your head. You're just kind of looking at it. What happens after uh, this brief gets filed? So now we're looking at a reply brief. So basically what's happened is the airline has said, please dismiss the case, Your Honor. They filed their motion. Um, the, uh, the lawyers at this firm have filed the response that was written by ChatGPT, but nobody knows it yet except the one, one of the lawyers who did it. Um, and then the, the other lawyers get a chance and it's sort of a ping pong back and forth. And so the airline gets to respond to this. And so they're just kind of responding like, you know, here's this motion. But then you see, um, you know, they have cite their cases and and... Now they're, the lawyers are kind of like, I don't know what's going on. They say in support of his position that the bankruptcy code tolls the two-year limitations period, which just means, you know, they're arguing that there's a, a pause on the statute of limitations. That's what's called tolling. Plaintiff cites to Varghese versus China Southern Airlines Co. Limited from the 11th Circuit. And then it says, the undersigned has not been able to locate this case by caption or citation, nor any case bearing any resemblance to it. Undersigned just means the lawyer who signed the brief. Plaintiff offers lengthy quotations purportedly from the Varghese case, including we, the 11th Circuit, have previously held that the automatic stay provisions of the Bankruptcy Code may toll the statute of limitations under the Warsaw Convention, which is the precursor to the Montreal Convention. We see no reason why the same rule should not apply under the Montreal Convention. The undersigned has not been able to locate this quotation, nor anything like it, in any case. And so um, what the lawyer is saying is basically like, look, I started searching this quote. I searched for the case because you can go take the quote and put it into Westlaw, into LexisNexis. Uh, into various search engines that lawyers use, you should have been able to find it, especially if it's an 11th Circuit case, because an appellate court case like that is like, you can't hide them. <laughs> like, they, like there's, there's, there are some, you know, in lower courts, sometimes they issue orders that don't get published or whatever, but um, an appellate court opinion is always going to be in all the databases. So they say, look, we can't find this. Um, they say that there's... Uh, but there's this other case that uh, that maybe uh, they're kind of like I don't know, they, 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 or this is also uh, purports to cite to Zickerman versus Korean Airlines Co. Uh, company. Um, there was a Supreme Court case that had that same name, but it doesn't seem to be it. Um, and then they uh, they're they're saying this Varghese case also cites these other cases that uh, we I can't find these cases right. So the, this lawyer, the lawyer on the other side is kind of just confused. It, it seems like which I certainly would be, um, and uh, they say basically like. This argument doesn't make any sense. It's not the real law. What are you talking about? And I can't find your cases supporting this. Um, and so they just kind of do that and then basically ar argue this. And um, they, then there's this, this footnote, which is just sort of like a note outside the main brief that says, um, you also are citing these other ones. And like, I can't find these, but maybe it's this one. I don't know. Um, you just kind of have some generally confused lawyers who are still just kind of fighting the argument, not really knowing what the heck is going on, which I don't think that you'd be able to in this scenario. I never would have anticipated this, this occurring myself personally. What, what does the court do? Because the, the judge and the law clerks at the court are probably looking at this, going the same thing as everyone else at this time. They're, they're like, okay, um, <laughs> there's these opinions, I guess. And so the court issues this order. Um, the order says, by April 18th, 2022, Peter LaDuca, counsel of record for plaintiff, shall file an affidavit and it's annexing, which just kind of means attaching, copies of the following cases cited in his submission to the court. And then it lists these ones that uh, the court was probably looking for and couldn't find. And then the judge says, failure to comply will result in dismissal of the action. Uh, so the court is kind of confused too, thinking it's just like, okay, um, where, what are these cases? Okay, so because of that court order, the, uh, these attorneys, and now another, another attorney shows up in this that we'll see who's actually the one who's using chat GPT, at least according to them, although it's kind of unclear um, <laughs> I'm not sure I trust really what these guys are saying, given what I've seen here. So um, they file what's supposed to be copies of the cases. And, and you can see this is a sworn affidavit, uh, which is very, very serious when you, if you're just making some, something up on purpose in this. So this guy, Leduca, which is the one who was swore on the first one, so he's now sworn twice. He says, I'm an attorney. I do, do hereby declare the foregoing is true and correct, that pursuant to court order, I've annexed copies of the following cases previously cited. And you can see there's all these cases that are supposedly here that I was unable to locate this case of Zickerman, uh, which was cited by the court in Varghese, but the opinions on the cases, um, uh, uh, basically like what I'm about to submit to you, may not be inclusive of the entire opinions, but only what is made available by online database. And that part here, when he says made available by online database, 
this is going to kill them because this, when I say they doubled and tripled down, this is the doubling down. They clearly have had some kind of problem. Everyone else is saying there's a problem. He says this opinion's unpublished. So, but he's also saying, I got this from some kind of online database, and we will see that is not where these cases came from. And now you can see this is signed by the original attorney, Peter Laduca, but now this other guy shows up, Stephen Schwartz, um, who is also uh, an attorney. And, and, and again, both these guys look like they're very experienced. They've been, doing, they've been around the block. They're here for 30 years or whatever, practicing law. So it's not, at first I was like, oh, this must be some junior associate. And that's kind of scary if you're an attorney, because you would never really check all the things that a junior associate is citing. Like if they wrote your brief, the, a brief for you, you would assume they're not going to lie or make something up. But at this point, they, when they're filing this document, they know there has to be something wrong. And what's really like to me, when I said the other document looked like a legal brief, um, these documents that we're looking at right now, which are supposed to be court opinions, are also generated by ChatGPT. So everything you're looking at right now um, was just kind of totally uh, uh, like written by a computer. Okay, so none of, none of this is like a human being. You're seeing it's like literally making up fakes facts. It's talking about this makes up a person's name, says they're a resident of Florida, they went to China, and then here's their layover. And like, you can see this like kind of reads like a real thing. It has all these citations to other cases. Um, but it's not like as a lawyer, this does not look like the real, real format for a 11th Circuit opinion. Um, when I would just right off the bat looking at this, I would be like, this does not seem to be a, like like there's no decision at the end. There's no, it kind of says there's one, but there's usually like length of text at the bottom. Uh, it's, it does, it's not clear like what database this was pulled out of. It's it, like if I'd seen this and didn't know it was from chat GPT, um, I would have like immediate sort of just red flags, like trying to read this and trying to figure out like, 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 like I, I, I would, I would have concern. It. The other thing, and this may be unique to me, I actually paused a minute to go check to make sure that I was right about this, but like even seeing the judges names, I was kind of like, what? Um, Higginbotham, uh, is, it's kind of an unusual name and that's a fifth circuit judge. Um, and I, I was kind of like, okay, was there an 11th circuit judge or maybe, maybe Higginbotham was on the 11th circuit. Or, like it wouldn't make sense. Like what's going on. Um, so the judge names are not even like real, uh, uh, judges from the circuit. Now the New York judges may not be as familiar, um, with the fifth circuit as like me, cause I've, you know, I worked on it, uh, and, and have met that judge, I guess. But, um, you know, it, it, you kind of just wonder looking at this, like it's literally not even using the right judges. Um, and these are also not like, this doesn't look like a real legal opinion. Um, it doesn't have like kind of the formatting at the top. They kind of are doing this, but it's not. Um, and now you can see it's like putting in stuff that looks like it would come from Lexus. Like these little stars um, are, are usually how the electronic databases have this as um, like numbering, but it's really just like a, um, <laughs> I, I'm trying to think of a non-profane way to say it. A half, uh, <laughs> you know, a half effort here that is to make these. This looks a little more real, this Ehrlich Airlines, but uh, it's like kind of the formatting of the databases, but then it has random stuff like, what's this page 367 here? That's not what this would look like. These second circuit guys will know like who these people are supposedly, are the, like, I mean, it's listing like law firm names and um, randomly has, you know, just like, some of it doesn't make even sense even if you start looking at this as like as an opinion, like the thing I'm noticing right off the bat is like, they're listing all these United States attorneys and attorney or attorney generals rather um, for amicus curie briefs and stuff. And it's just sort of strange, like, see this, um, like, are all these going to be real, right? When, when you're looking at this as a whole, like you, you go through all these and you see these weird formattings and you don't know, like, are any of these going to be like correct or not? And, and the other thing that is stands out, I think also looking at this is, um, why are all these opinions in different formats if you're pulling them off an electronic database? Like, like most of the time, attorneys use one database. Um, and like, uh, I use LexisNexis, for example. Um, all my opinions, if I pulled them, would be in the same format because I'm going, you know, if I'm grabbing out 10 judicial opinions, I'm going to be using my LexisNexis account to go print them out into a PDF and then submit them. So it's odd to see them all in the different formats. So what happens next after... They submit these sworn, like swearing, oh, I went to an electronic database and got these, and these are the opinions I found that were cited. Okay, so they, they filed this, and now the attorneys for the airline have seen it, and they filed this letter with the court, and they go, um, Judge, we write to address certain issues relating to the documents filed with the plaintiff's attorney's affidavit, which is an understatement. Uh, they say, hey, look, the court said, file these opinions. Defendant respectfully submits that the authenticity of many of these cases is questionable. 
For instance, the Varghese and Miller cases purportedly are federal appellate cases published in the Federal Reporter. We could not locate these cases in the Federal Reporter using a Westlaw search. We also searched PACER, which is another database, for the cases using the document, the docket numbers written on the first page of the submissions. Those searches resulted in different cases. And then they basically say, look, we, we, we're searching all this stuff, and we're not finding these things. And then... Um, then these other two, they say, okay, these cases exist, but like they're and they're the only ones in a conventional format, which is kind of the ones we were looking at at the bottom. Um, and then we and then they say also like we can't locate this thing you say is unpublished. So like where is all this stuff that and, and what's up with this? Then the judge issues what's called an order to show cause. That is not an order generally that you want to. Get. <laughs> Sometimes they're innocuous, but this one is not. Um, an order to show cause basically says you need to show up and tell me why I shouldn't do something. Um, and usually it's something to you or often something to you. Um, and so th here's what the judge uh, and the, he'll he'll have two orders. This is the first one. It says the court is presented with an unprecedented circumstance. A submission filed by plaintiff's counsel in opposition to a motion to dismiss is replete with citations to non-existent cases. When the circumstance was called to the court's attention by opposing counsel, the court issued orders requiring plaintiff's counsel to provide an affidavit. And it's annexing copies of certain judicial opinions of courts of record cited in his submission, and he has complied. Six of the submitted cases appear to be bogus judicial decisions with bogus quotes and bogus internal citations. Set forth below is an order to show cause why plaintiff's counsel ought not be sanctioned. And then it says, sort of, it says the court begins with a more complete description of what is meant by a non-existent or bogus opinion. And then the court starts talking about these uh, decisions. Um, and it, so this judge actually calls up the clerk of the, of the 11th Circuit. So the clerk is like this office that sort of runs the, um, uh, they make the trains run on time or whatever. <laughs> they're, they're, they're the guys who like actually do a lot of like the, the um, non-opinion type work and some, some opinion work, but they, they, they do all the administrative stuff for, for the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. And the clerk says, um, there has never been a case with that party name since 2010, which is the furthest back that our electronic system goes. The clerk says that docket number is for a different case, and here's that case. Uh, then the court says, I can't, I can't find it on Westlaw. I can't find it on Lexis, which are the two big uh, places to search. And when I put in the number, you say it goes to this other case from the, uh, it's a completely different one, from an entirely different court of appeals. And then the court says the bogus, quote, Varghese decision contains internal citations and quotes, which are in turn non-existent. So then the court just goes through like every um, pretend legal opinion that chat GPT just made up. And at this point, the court has no idea what's going on. The court's just like, I have this, like, like someone has just faked a bunch of legal opinions and submitted them to me. And that's why the court says this is unprecedented. Like, uh, it probably looked to the court. I'm sure the judge is sitting there thinking, like, who went to all this work, like, to do this? Um, and then it orders this attorney to, like, you better show up, come in here at high noon on June 8th, and you're going to show why I shouldn't sanction you for citing non-existent cases or submitting these fake judicial opinions in your uh, affidavit. And if you want to call witnesses, then you better say so soon. And then uh, the court kind of has these footnotes that say that, like, um, you need to address this anomaly that, that the, there's a notary public that uh, on this affidavit that swears on the 25th of January 2023, what's going on? I want to see an actual, like, the, the they call it a wet ink signed copy, which means the court now wants to see like the physical signature of this notary who actually turns out to be the guy behind all of this stuff. So, okay. Now these attorneys have realized they're in trouble. <laughs> and, and so uh, they've submitted another affidavit. This is one that after this court has issued the show cause order going, you have bogus cases. Um, they are like, are like, okay, now I'll tell you what's going on. So this says it's this Peter Laduca Esquire uh, uh, submits this in response to that order. We just looked at states as follows. As your affiant is associated with the firm of Levido, Levido, and Oberman, uh, Roberto uh, Mata became a client of this firm, having signed a retainer uh, prior to February of 2022. And that's why I was confused earlier about the gender of uh, was suing. It looks like in they, they are messing that up, and they called it Roberta in one of the I was looking at. The per, uh, uh, man. Uh, the firm was representing Mr. Mata for injuries he sustained while a passenger on defendant Avianca Airlines due to the negligence of one of their employees. It says, this matter was assigned to Stephen Schwartz Esquire. Attorney with Levido, Levido, and Oberman, Mr. Schwartz opened the file and handled the representation of Mr. Mata. Um, and so Schwartz, Stephen Schwartz, is the guy that we saw as a notary, which is not an attorney. Um, so the court was looking at, probably looking at that prior declaration, thinking that there's an, it, saw that stuff about, like, I want to see the inked copy uh, because the date's wrong on the notarization. So this attorney was notarizing a declaration of the other attorney 
um, but didn't, didn't say, hey, here's what I did. So now we're finding out, okay, actually the guy running this was Steve Schwartz. Um, and reason, so this says Mr. Schwartz conducted the investigation of, the, of this file, filed this, filing a summons and complaint, commencing this action, um, and it got removed, which means it went from state court to federal court. And this says, um, Mr. Schwartz had been handling this matter from its outset and was thoroughly familiar with same. However, Mr. Schwartz is not admitted to practice in the Southern District of New York. Therefore, it was decided that Mr. Schwartz would continue to perform intra-office legal work on the, on, in, on the matter, and any document filing would be handled by your affiant, who was admitted to the Southern District of New York and had access to the filing system. So what they're saying basically is this guy, like he's a New York attorney, Mr. Schwartz, but, but he's only licensed, like he hasn't gone and gotten um, admitted to the federal court uh, for the Southern District. There's a process where you go, um, like, so even if you're, uh, like, say, I'm in California, um, there's four districts in California. You have to go separately to each district. And even after you get your bar license in California, then you can practice in state court. But to practice in federal court, you have to separately get approved by each uh, district in the state to go in that district. They're saying this Schwartz guy never got approved with the Southern District, even though he's been practicing for a very long time, it looks like. And instead, he's basically filing th things through this guy, um, uh, Peter LaDuca, who we've seen signing these declarations. That's not, that itself is not unusual. That, is, that would not freak me out. It's something that normally happens. Um, it's not a big deal. It is perfectly okay. Uh, but it does mean that Mr. Le, uh, Loduca is responsible over these filings. He has to sort of like make sure that everything's okay and like sort of watch what's going on. Um, and uh, the problem here is, is while he might have been able to sort of, Mr. Loduca, the first guy, might have been able to get off on this, he had like... Once they found out the cases were fake, if he'd right away been like, hey, what is this? And done something about it. This is the tripling down. They keep, we saw the doubling down when they submitted all those fake cases that kind of obviously had red flags. Now we're looking at tripling down and what are they going to say about what they've done? Okay, so what is the work that Stephen Schwartz was doing on this? So they say that, um, that the, the, the uh, guy who's signing this, uh, which is Mr. Laduca, Mr. Laduca was not personally doing any legal research. He didn't have personal knowledge of how it was conducted, which is also kind of normal if, uh, like, you know, I think like I was saying earlier, um, you're, if you have an associate working for you, a younger attorney, in this case, it's a very senior attorney, but um, you wouldn't double check every single thing they did in you know, brief. You'd read it, you'd check it, um, but you would go make sure the cases were real. That's not something I would, like, think about doing ever. Um, and then it, it says that the, uh, the so he's... This other attorney is familiar with the circumstances based on conversations with Mr. Schwartz. Um, as I've been working here since 1996, Mr. Schwartz actually was already at the firm. Mr. Schwartz has been practicing law in New York for over 30 years. So again, this, this guy is not a junior associate. He's a very senior attorney. Um, he says, I've never had something like this happen between us. Um, uh, I've never seen Mr. Schwartz make, make a deliberate false statement or have any intention to deceive a court. Um, I've, I've known him and practiced with him for 25 years. I've never been aware of him making a false statement. Um, says, um, I, I had no reason to doubt the authenticity of the case law contained therein. At, the, at first, before the doubling down would have made sense, I, I do think once you... This guy should have put more work into... Both these guys should have put more work into these cases once they saw that this there was something up with this. Um, even if this, the first attorney, uh, Leduca, uh That's right, uh, Loduca, uh, even if he doesn't know chat GPT's involved, he's got to know something's up when he sees those cases. They're, they're just too weird. Too weird to have so many of those that aren't, aren't like matching up with anything. Like, why didn't he go check it in Lexus once was literally an order from a court saying, hey, attach these. Um, so he says, um, I had no reason Mr. Schwartz is going to be a witness. Um, I've attached an affidavit prepared by Mr. Schwartz representing information that will be presented at the hearing. It offers an explanation of the research performed. And he says, there, therefore, like, please don't sanction me. That's what Leduca says. Um, so, and then now you've got a different notary public notarizing this one. Um, and so now we see, what is this Steven Schwartz guy who appears now for the first time in the case? Okay, I'm an attorney at the same law firm. Um, I am the one who started this personal injury action in the state court. I'm not admitted in the Southern District, kind of what the same thing the other guy was saying. And then he says, as the use of generative artificial intelligence has evolved within law firms, your affiant consulted the artificial intelligence website, ChatGP, in order to supplement the legal research performed. So he, Schwartz is saying, um, I... Uh, like decided I was going to like sort of supplement the work I was doing and have part of this done by ChatGPT. It was in consultation with the generative artificial intelligence website ChatGPT that your affiant did locate and cite the following cases in the affirmation in opposition submitted, which this court has found to be non-existent. 
he goes to the, these cases that don't actually exist. It says, the citations and opinions in question were pro provided by ChatGPT, also provided its legal source, and assured the reliability of its content. Excerpts from the queries presented and responses provided are attached here too. And, and this is sort of the weirdest or funniest part of this or saddest part of this opinion when you see it below. It says that uh, I relied on the legal opinions provided to, to, to him by the source that has revealed itself to be unreliable. Graphian has never utilized ChatGPT as a source for conducting legal research prior to this occurrence, therefore was unaware of the possibility that its content could be false. Uh, it's the fault of, of me and not confirming even Schwartz and not confirming the sources provided by ChatGPT of the legal opinions it provided. Um, Court says, I have no intent to support nor the defendant. It says, Mr. Laduca had no role in performing the research, nor do you have any knowledge of how said research was conducted, and neither of us have ever had any issues, and I greatly re regret having utilized generative artificial intelligence to supplement the legal research. I'll never do so in the future without absolute verification of its authenticity. Then here's, I mean, the, to me, it's sort of like, the problem is like, we're going to watch this guy dig a hole so deep, I cannot even, uh, it's painful to me to look at what he does. Here, here's chat GPT. He says, he asks it, is Varghese a real case? Yes, Varghese versus China is a real case. What is your source? Let me see if I can rotate this. So it's, uh, read. I'm, I'm rotating my head, so I may as well not make y'all rotate your heads, too, to watch this. Upside down. Another one. Two. Now y'all can see what he's saying. And so, um, he, he's, so he asks chat GPT, it's real. Okay, what's your source, chat GPT? So rotate this one again, two, three. That GPT says, uh, apo I apologize for the, confusing, for the confusion earlier. Upon double checking, I found that the case Varghese does indeed exist and can be found on legal research databases such as Westlaw and LexisNexis. I apologize for any inconvenience or confusion my earlier responses may have caused, uh, which is a little odd. It almost looks like something being omitted here because it's kind of like, um, what is your source? I apologize. Like, it seems like maybe he's asking other stuff to this, which really doesn't matter, but it's what's weird to me and painful to me is, is why is he asking it this stuff? Why, why are you asking chat GDP? Like, Hey, is this a fake? Like, it's just, uh, and he says, are the other cases you provided fake? No, the other cases I provided are real and can be found in reputable legal databases such as Lexus, Nexus and Westlaw. So his defense is, Oh, well, I went to chat GTP and I said, Hey, is this real? And chat GPT, it, it was like, it's cool. You're cool, bro. The case is surreal. They're not fake. And then he's like, oh, okay, uh, we're good. Um, that, that is not, none of this is acceptable in any way, shape, or form. I think he's probably going to flip, the, the court will flip out, I think, reading this. I would if I was the judge. Because the, the problem that you're looking at is when was this chat submitted? Like to chat GPT. When's he doing this? So he, it seems it has to have been like after this thing's been flagged. Because, like, why would he go in there and, and ask ChatGPT, is Varghese a real case? Like, what kind of question is that to even type into ChatGPT? Because it indicates you have some doubts about it. Which means he must have been doing, if he was doing this at the beginning, he's real, real in trouble. Because that means he's, like, even doubting if this is real. If he's doing it at the, after the court's order, it sounds like this is the only thing he did was go into this, like, chat bot and be like, so you didn't lie to me, bro, right? Chat bot's like, no, no, dude, I don't, I don't lie about something like that. And then he's just like, it's fine. That's, that's not checking, okay? You, you could take this number, type this thing into Lexis, Westlaw, Google Scholar, there's many, like, you would, you would find it. You would probably find it putting the text into Google if it existed. And so he just, you know, the, the chatbot says it's in Westlaw and LexisNexis, and he just apparently takes the word of this robot for it and doesn't ever uh, follow up on anything. So this is the part of this that really is going to get this guy both these guys, frankly, because the problem is that at, at some point in here, they know something's up. And it does look like the, these two lawyers are just sort of scrambling to try to find, you know, maybe the first lawyer uh, doesn't really know what Schwartz is doing, but he, he has to know, has to know that uh, there's something up with these cases when the other, the second the other side files that reply and goes, I can't find them. First thing I would do is go like, oh no, and I would go to Lexis and go to Westlaw and go to Google Scholar. I, the absolute last thing, first of all, I wouldn't use chat GPT, period. Uh, but if I did use it, uh, I would not go back to it and be like, hey, bro, what's up, man? Are we still cool? I like that would not be sufficient checking to make sure like once you know you're in this, you like you just have duties to do other stuff. So um, this is all kind of crazy. We don't know what the judge is going to do yet. Um, I'm predicting nuclear level reaction from looking at this stuff, but we will see what that judge does about this. What does this mean for the legal industry in general? 
So if anyone thought warriors were going to be using AI anytime soon, this one case will set that back decades. Um, and, and this is always what I've kind of thought about it is to like, okay, yeah, you're going to have this AI stuff. Um, it can be useful for, you know, um, like our law firm uses a lot of, of AI type stuff for um, automated tasks, but they're not things where the lawyer is removed from the loop or is allowed to just sort of like, there's no lawyers involved, right? Like you can do an example is you can sort of automate things like um, demand letters, um, but somebody has to write it. You can't like have this, the, a robot write it first. It can, you can reuse um, parts of like a demand letter. You can, you can set up a, a software and we have software that will like auto plug in what you expect, you know, uh, the formatting and paragraphs that are usually there or that are always there for a certain uh, type of defendant. Um, you can put in a placeholder that's like, hey, attorney, fill this out. Um, you can't just rely on chat GPT to write a legal brief. And the people who think this is going to go take over the legal industry, I think will probably be the last, the last thing automated because we can make rules saying you're not allowed to use it or you're not allowed to have an AI robot. Uh, and I think those rules will be made because there will be more disasters like this. One disaster like this will make uh, lawyers are, we're, we're a conservative profession in general in terms of change. Lawyers don't like change. Uh, they don't like change the way they do things. They, um, and uh, very old people are sort of in charge of the profession. And um, this makes it look, and it is like, it's certainly the current version of AI would be a total disaster. It would uh, result in serious uh, uh, ethics issues with uh, like not having lawyers check stuff. It, it would you just can't rely on it in the same way that you can a human being. And I, very much predict that we will start having rules against doing stuff like this. We'll have rules uh, against using AI in, in a lot of ways that will be happening in other professions. You won't just go get to click a button and hear some art because uh, we can make it illegal to do stuff in, like that in court. We, and, and they will. Um, when the judge sees like, something like this once, they are never going to let that before them again. Uh, I, I think that the bar associations will start restricting this. They will start making it unethical to do things like this. Um, and, and probably should, at least at this point. Maybe, maybe one day AI is smart enough to be a lawyer. It is not right now. So... Uh, this is a good thing about being a lawyer to preserve your job is you get to write the rules about who gets to do your job. <laughs> That's maybe some people don't like that. Uh, there, you know, there are reasons why, you know, we do have underserved populations in terms of legal issues, but, and maybe there are uh, areas where the rules do need to be loosened up or uh, people, uh, you know, frankly, I think lawyers need to be encouraged to go uh, help people more and do more, pro, like not pro bono, but uh, stop working for giant corporations and start helping regular people might be a good idea. Uh, it would probably help solve a lot of our problems if more lawyers did that. Uh, but uh, allowing robots to write your legal briefs and make up legal cases is not the solution. And that I, I very much see these lawyers getting, they may not be lawyers. Sort of sad, but uh, it's a sad end to the career. But the, the problem is the doubling down and the tripling down. The, the, the problem is not necessarily the first brief. It might, if they had submitted a, a fall on your sword thing right after that, they might've been okay, but they just kept going. And, and I don't think the judge is going to like any of this at all. So uh, you want to see more crazy lawsuits and stuff like this and more explanation of the legal profession and, uh, even for lay people, like uh, I think it's real interesting. I think if you like law shows or whatever, or want to go to law school, which some people do, and, and I encourage people if they want to go help people to do that, uh, you, you can actually make use of your law degree in a good way. Hit subscribe. You'll see more videos like this, and there may be more on the end screen. Might be interesting.